the rest of the story. It all started in Bridgeport, Connecticut, more than a century ago. There was a pie company in town, big bakery. All they baked was pies. The company drivers used horse-drawn wagons to deliver their product back then. One day, during the driver's lunch break, they were all standing around in back of the shop, a bit bored maybe. One of the drivers got an idea. He reached in the back of his pie wagon and pulled out one of the company's wares from a stack and heaved it directly at one of the other drivers. It was a direct hit. Well, the rest of the employees thought this was terribly funny, and before anyone knew what was happening, all of the drivers were hurling the company's products at one another. And as far as I know, nothing like this had ever happened anywhere before. The pie company drivers found that this particular activity was an ideal way to relieve boredom, and beginning on that day, it became a regular noontime recreation. Now... Before you start thinking of this as the great Bridgeport pie fight, I should explain that the company employees, over many months of practice, developed it into a real art. They discovered, for example, that the accuracy of the throw depended on a special way of holding the pie tin and a certain forward wrist action just before the release. You might have guessed that one day the pie company president just happened to be passing by about noon. He saw his workers engaged in this peculiar pastime. He became rather annoyed. After all, this was company property the drivers were tossing about so recklessly. But you know, the sheer exhilaration derived from this odd recreation was irrepressible in itself. And pretty soon Yale University students picked up on it. Throwing became a craze. And then Harvard, never far behind Yale in college fads, began throwing on campus. Some irreverent students even called it a sport. Might interest you to know that all of the while that Bridgeport Pie Company products were the only ones used in honor of the company drivers who had invented the pastime. Purdue followed Harvard in the craze. Then Notre Dame followed Purdue. In a short while, every major college in the country was into the act. And it all started in Bridgeport, Connecticut, more than a century ago with the employees of a local pie company. They began throwing the company's products at each other during lunch break as a way of letting off steam. In fact, the activity is successful even today. For that same pie company in Bridgeport, Connecticut, sold 80,000 pies daily as recently as 1956. And though the company itself no longer exists, the pastime innovated by their drivers in the early 1870s is prevalent to this day. For the pie company wares tossed about by the drivers were not the pies themselves, but the pie tins. And today, one of those original pie tins is on display in the Smithsonian Institution because of its, because of its aeronautical significance. And the name of the Bridgeport, Connecticut Pie Company is embossed on that pie tin. The name, the Frisbee Pie Company. The containers of which became, that's right, the Frisbee, only now you know the origin, for now you know the rest of the story. And now for the rest of the rest of the story. In 1871, William Russell Frisbee purchased a branch of the Olds Baking Company and renamed it the Frisbee Pie Company, spelled F-R-I-S-B-I-E. Their best sellers were pies and cookies. In 1903, William died and his son, Joseph Peter Frisbee, continued in his stead. You can see young Joseph in the window of this photograph of the Frisbee Pie Company Bakery. With Joseph's leadership, the company expanded in the northeastern states. He created a pie rimmer modeled after a potter's wheel and a cruster that could process 80 pies per minute. In 1940, the Frisbee Pie Company churned out about 200,000 pies daily and employed close to 800 workers. Their pie varieties included such delights as apricot prune whip and cherry cream along with local favorites of custard and lemon. As the Frisbee name was stamped on each of the company's pie pans, people began calling these and other types of flying discs Frisbees. The name stuck. In the late 1940s, Walter Frederick Fred Morrison created his own Frisbee out of plastic. 
On July the 8th, 1947, the Roswell Daily Record reported the capture of a flying saucer on a ranch in the region of Roswell. Based on the flying saucer craze, Fred designed his plastic frisbee to resemble a flying saucer. In the early 1950s, Fred began selling his flying disc named Pluto Platters in stores in Los Angeles. Pluto Platters were manufactured by the American Trends Company. They came in a variety of colors and are highly sought out by uh, frisbee collectors. Take a look, you may have one in your attic. In 1957, Whammo purchased the manufacturing and marketing rights for the Pluto Platter. Whammo created new games for the flying disc, including a game similar to horseshoes. The box contained four Pluto Platters, two stakes, and a rope to correctly measure the distance. The stakes were to be placed 20 to 40 feet apart. The object of the game, as in horseshoes, was to get the saucers close to the post and, if possible, to hit it. The closest saucer to the post earned one point. The saucer hitting the post received three points. The farthest saucer from the post lost a point. The first person or team to reach ten points won the game. Whammo President Rich Nur read in a Sports Illustrated magazine that college students in the eastern United States referred to all flying discs, including their Pluto platter, Frisbees. Rich reportedly said, if that will sell more Pluto platters, we'll call them by that name too. To avoid copyright infringement, in 1957, Whammo changed the spelling of Frisbee with an IE to Frisbee with two E's. F-R-I-S-B-E-E. -E. Sales of the flying discs called Frisbees soared, but the pie company floundered. After Joseph Peter Frisbee passed away, his widow, Marion Rose Frisbee, and plant manager Joseph J. Vaughn kept the company going. But operations ceased in 1958, largely due to the difficulty of keeping up with rapid technological advances in the widespread consolidation of bakeries. That should have been the end of the Frisbee Pie Company. But in 2009, avid Frisbee player and collector Dan O'Connor was at an estate auction in Hartford, Connecticut. Dan won a bidding war for some recipes and photographs that once belonged to Joseph Vaughn, the plant manager at the Frisbee Pie Company. In 2016, Dan purchased the license and distribution rights to the Frisbee Pie Company. To add to the nostalgia, Dan also had a 1936 Chevy panel truck restored in the style of the Frisbee Pie Company's once vast fleet of delivery vehicles. I want to wish nothing but success to Dan and his Frisbee Pie Company. And Dan, if you're watching, please send me a chocolate pie. I'm Brad Dyson. Thank you very much for watching. And as Paul Harvey would say, good day.